Good afternoon, it's Monday the 8th of June 2015, at just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Uh, behind the technical desk, we've got Nick Green, and outside we've got the most unbelievable sunshine, blue skies, um, settled weather cloud, apparently with a flat base to the clouds. Are you happy with that? Yep. Good, there we are. Now, what we'd like to say before we get into the news itself is thank you very much uh, to all of you that um, donate to the UK column. We couldn't do what we do without your support. And we'd like to say thank you very much to the person who re recently wrote to us, but wishes to remain anonymous. So thank you very much. We received your letter this morning. Uh, well, what's been going on in the, uh, in the news, really? Money, well, I just wanted money. to start off with this <clears throat> this article from Zero Hedge. Literally, your ATM won't work. It's a discussion about cash. He, he starts off by saying, uh, um, "We're thinking, uh, sorry, why we're thinking about what was really going on with today's strange new money system." A startling thought occurred to us: our financial system could take a surprising and catastrophic twist that almost nobody imagines, let alone anticipates. Do you remember when a lethal tsunami hit the beaches? in Southeast Asia, killing thousands of people and causing billions of dollars of damage. Well, just before the 80-foot wall of water slammed into the coast, an odd thing happened. The water disappeared. The tide went out further than anyone had seen before. Local fishermen headed for high ground immediately. They knew what it meant, but the tourists went onto the beaches looking for shells. The same thing could happen to the money supply, and of course that's one of the things we've been warning about for quite a long time. And then he ends by saying, uh, cash only, the sign will say, because the machinery of the credit economy will be breaking down. The gas station, its suppliers and its financiers will, will not want to get stuck with a credit from your bankrupt lender. Whose credit cards are still good? Whose lines of credit are still valuable? Whose bank is ready to fail? Who can pay his mortgage? Who will honour the credit card debt? Uh, in a crisis, those questions will be as common as who will win an Oscar is today, but no one will know the answers. Quickly, they will stop guessing and turn to cash. Um, well, I don't agree with that. In, I agree with it mostly. I don't agree with it. Uh, the final mm. point about uh, turning to cash, because, of course, uh, just as uh, happened in the 1930s with the confiscation of gold, and there's a very good chance that cash will be confiscated. And in the meantime, as we all know, um, they're doing everything to remove cash from the uh, from the financial system as yeah. it stands at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this is the, this is the least of our worries that people will be turning to cash. There won't be enough cash to go around. Um, and so really in this kind of uh, doomsday scenario, what we're really looking at is massive civil unrest uh, and people fighting with each other for the limited resources, resources. of cash that are there. So. Uh, one of the other things that uh, Zero Hedge has, and I suggest everybody goes and has a look at the article, covers this. Uh, they're highlighting this book that was published in 1922 called U.S. Money versus, uh, sorry, 1912, it must have been, uh, U.S. Money versus Corporation Currency, the Aldrich Plan. And this is about the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank. And what he's really pointing out is how Alfred Owen Crozier, the person who wrote this uh, this book, which was priced at a very good 25 cents in those days, um, was really putting some fantastic little uh, um, diagrams into his book, which pretty much sum up how the financial system has ended up today. Uh, so they've got the octopus, then we've got a billion liability. Of course, a billion was quite a lot in those days. Uh, and it says, Aldrich, Uncle Sam, some of my friends want to start a little National Reserve Association to corner the currency and credit of the country. I promised you you would endorse their paper for a billion dollars. Here's the note. Just put, uh, just put your name across the back. So I mean, this is exactly what has happened. Uh, and then we got this: uh, 39 billions of debt bonds, the world's bonded debt. It's exactly what has happened. Um, the inflated bank credit and the financial bubbles, and so on. Really fantastic. A, a fixed casino is what they're saying here. And of course, fantastic the book, little book. Yeah. The book, all the more powerful, might be able to see it in hindsight of all those years that have gone past. So. He was, he was a glimpse into the future. Well, we are it, seeing it as reality. That, that's exactly right. Um, and, uh, and Associated Press, as if uh, uh, to, to sort of underline this, talking today about the phony numbers that are misleading investors, and they're talking about the corporate results that are being announced by various, uh, various corporations. Uh, these record profits that companies are reporting may not, may, may not be all they're cracked up to be, Associated Press is saying. 
As the stock market climbs ever higher, professional investors are warning that companies are presenting misleading versions of the results. They ignore a wide variety of normal costs of running a business and make it seem like they're doing better than they really are. What's worse, the financial analysts who are supposed to fight corporate spin are often playing along. Instead of challenging the companies, they're largely passing along the rosy numbers in reports recommending stocks to investors. Um, well, of course, that's not quite the case, is it? Because what's actually going on, and this is a bit ironic that uh, uh, Associated Press would be uh, forgetting to mention this little uh, part of this since Associated Press is one of the companies that's using Automated Insights to write their financial uh, results stories. Uh, so Automated Insights automatically generating news stories based on the phony numbers that Associated Press have just been talking about. Um, so, you know, what, what chance is there when, in fact, they're not, it's not even the case uh, that uh, the rosy numbers are being passed along by the reporters here. It's the fact that the reporters are being removed from the, from the equation altogether and being replaced with a computer algorithm, which is looking at these numbers uh, without any kind of uh, oversight or, yeah. or due diligence. Or, or proper understanding, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, love of money, root of all evil, um, pretty true words. What else is going on in the country? Well, um, the state is increasingly spying on us. And uh, we uh, like to thank the viewer, as always, that pointed out this article from the Metro. This is from a few days ago. Uh, but it says, if you're one of those people that gets a bit vocal about politics, you'll be interested to know that your Facebook, Twitter and personal blog are about to begin being monitored for references to the government. I uh, encourage you to go and have a look at this article. Um, ministers announced yesterday the government has awarded a contract to five companies who will monitor what people tweet, uh, put on Facebook or blog about the government and provide updates to Whitehall in real time. Officials and ministers will provide a list of keywords and topics to the companies so that they know what to monitor. Now, what's interesting in the article, I couldn't find any actual names for the companies that have got this contract. So um, if anybody out there can help us on this one with some research, who are these mysterious companies that have been giving, uh, given authority by government to uh, snoop on us? And uh, our reply is really this. Um, uh, let's have a look at how this lot comes together. Uh, we've got um, a Stasi state building. We are deliberately using this language because this is what is happening. There's a cabal controlling government. These two names, Francis Maud, Oliver Letwin, we know are of great concern to senior military personnel uh, because these two men uh, would seem to be controlling the cabinet office. Now, let's remember what's uh, been brought in, behavioural change, where the government says they can use applied psychology, change the way we think, behave and what we understand. And of course, they're also working with the political charity Common Purpose, including making sure that they can get contracts with no minutes of the meetings. Uh, and now we've got this, of course, state monitoring Facebook, Twitter and blogs. And if we follow it through with the Home Office and Theresa May that we've been warning about consistently, uh, she has built a whole spider's web of spying organisations, uh, which of course include the police, the intelligence services, but also the highly dangerous multi-agency public protection arrangement, MAPA, which is going to spy on what you are doing. Well, what's our response to this? Uh, it's simply don't waste your money on private companies, Mr. Cameron. If you want to know what the UK column is thinking and tweeting, uh, we've put it here. Uh, we're coming on to this subject in a minute. Can't make it up as the BBC fails to do with its own paedophiles, i.e. Jimmy Savile. Uh, but the BBC's now jumped in bed with the Met Police to help both boost their image. Um, so there we are, straight to David Cameron and the Cabinet Office, uh, we're on your case. But remember, it was only a few weeks ago that we were also warning about what Francis Maud was doing in All Matters Digital. And uh, let's just have a look at this quickly. Uh, we had a Mr Mike Bracken, who was the Cabinet Office Director of Digital. Uh, he was pushing through um, a very comprehensive strategy that the government could get its little fingers and snouts into any, any communication that was digital. 
Uh, here we are, government as a platform to be opened up to allow third parties to use government data. Well, of course, they don't mean government data. They mean our data. Uh, we've got uh, more on data in this little inset, but this is the key bit. We need to align our efforts so that we're as effective as possible in using public data for the benefit of citizens oh, and businesses. So this is nothing to do with uh, looking after the general public. This is about allowing big business, big profits uh, to not only snoop on us, but use our data for profit. And here's one of the organisations we uh, flagged up, uh, Dodds Group, PLC. Uh, you can see this in your own time, but essentially another spider's web uh, where we've got the government mixing it with big companies. And of course, who are we interested in that little mix? Here's dear old Capita, uh, which seems to be gaining more and more power. Uh, Guy uh, Cleaver, you can find him on LinkedIn. Um, he's the managing director of Dodds Group. Um, there's quite a lot of information on him, uh, but this is the big bit. Our training business, business, Westminster explained, is a key part of the civil service learning and capita, deliver, delivering the curriculum for the government policy profession. So we've got a private company training the civil servants. So, sorry, can we just go back? I don't know if we can. Yeah, um, I can bring that up. government policy profession? Yeah. Government policy has now become a profession. Indeed, yeah. So, so policy is no longer set by ministers. It's now set by civil servants who take that on as a profession. Is that what Taught that suggests? by private companies, of course. Wow. Okay. It's not suggesting, Mike, because this is already in place. Of course, the public has no idea this is going on, uh, but this is the communitarian uh, or fascist state, whatever you want to call it, it's very nasty, being built by not just David Cameron, but a few of his key players behind doors with common purpose, of course. So um, we just run it through. Here's the government innovation group. This is another level of what's going on. The cabinet office announced the appointment of Helen Stevenson and Paul Matby as joint directors of the government innovation group. This was a headline from a few weeks ago, uh, but here we are. And here he mentions the behavioral insights team known as the nudge unit. And if we go to the other side, here's Helen and she's talking about big society capital. So this is the communitarian state, massive attack on our constitution. Indeed, which brings us on to the constitution because the uh, independent here uh, has started a, a, this is day one of a major new series. They're calling it the independent guide to the UK constitution. Um, we explore the rights of citizens is what they say about this. So they're talking about the 20 key texts uh, the 20 key texts. Does text not mean writing? Well, um, <laughs> text, text seems to me to mean writing. And so Britain's unwritten constitution. But there you go. Anyway, this is Britain's unwritten constitution. And of course, they start off with Magna Carta. Uh, and they say signed by King John, uh, which it wasn't. Uh, the first Magna Carta is now of largely symbolic value. Well, that's very interesting that they should say that since it has yet to fail when it's been introduced into a court case. So how it's of largely symbolic value, I'm not sure. Paragraphs 39 and 40 remain uh, the most famous of all assertions of British subjects' rights. So what does that say? It says, uh, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him or send upon him except by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Uh, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. And then, of course, the other clause that's important uh, with regard to the, in this context is uh, we will appoint as justices, constables, sheriffs or bailiffs, only such as know the law of the realm and mean to observe it. And, of course, that is something which is absolutely not happening. But for them to suggest that uh, Magna Carta is of largely sim symbolic value is a disgrace. Um, then they co come on to the Assize of Clarendon, uh, 1166, promulgated by Henry II, this otherwise obscure document is the earliest significant written underpinning, again, there's unwritten, written, they, can't, they don't seem to be able to make up their minds, of the principle of trial by jury. So this is a significant underpinning of the principle, of a principle which existed for centuries before uh, this document. And uh, this is a key point. Each of these documents uh, that make up our constitution were reassertions of principles already established. 
Um, so principles have to be reasserted, of course, when governments get out of control and attempt to subvert them, uh, or they attempt to remove our inalienable God-given rights. Um, so that's why we reassert these things. Then the next one of the, the other documents they mention, of course, is the Bill of Rights. Now, of course, this is a document which this present government denies exists because they say that Britain needs a Bill of Rights and they're working to bring about a British Bill of Rights. Strange that we had one since 1689. And this says uh, that it's the legislative fruit of the glorious revolution of 1688. This crucial document lays down limits on the powers of the monarch and sets out the rights of Parliament. Well, there are a number of uh, points here. The first is, of course, that the, the Bill of Rights, just like Magna Carta, um, was a peace treaty. So it, it, uh, it reasserted, once again, the, uh, the relationship between the state and the monarch, or between the people and the monarch, uh, and it put limits on the powers of the monarch and set out the rights of Parliament. Now, what it didn't do, of course, was give Parliament supremacy. Um, and this is something that has come much later. Um, this is uh, dicey that they're talking about here, source of the oft-quoted view that the twin pillars of the UK Constitution are the supremacy of Parliament and the rule of law. Now, um, the, the problem is that our current Parliament is completely out of control. So the Bill of Rights was there to deal with the divine right of kings, but now we have a Parliament with th which thinks that his, it has the divine right of, of Parliament. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's never what the supremacy of Parliament was intended to mean. Uh, Parliament, as is the monarch, is subject to the rule of law, and the rule of law limits what government can do and what Parliament can do. It is not subject, and I'm going to apologise here, it is not subject to the rule of buggery of children, which is what uh, our Parliament seems to be based on, um, because that's how our, the control of participants uh, is taking place at the moment. And of course, on the basis of that, this present parliament has no, no legitimacy. Um, and the other um, thing that they point out here is the Human Rights Act. Um, and they're saying that this defines the relationship between UK statute. You notice they don't mention common law here at all. And of course, our constitution is based on the common law. It's not based, it's not statutory uh, in, in its foundations. Um, so defines the relationship between UK statute and the European Convention of Human Rights and it includes a rare statutory statement on the right of freedom of speech. And of course, I think it's that uh, rare statutory statement on the right of freedom of speech, which is why uh, it's the main reason why Cameron wants to get rid of the Human Rights Act um, at the moment. And then this has got to be the ultimate disgrace of the whole article, the fact that they include the cabinet manual in it. This, the most up-to-date document setting out the laws, conventions, rules, setting out how government works with particular reference to the formation of governments. Now, let's just, 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 sorry, let me just, no, Nick, put that back up again, if you could, please, for a sec. Let me just remi remind everybody what the Cabinet Manual is. Uh, it was originally published as a draft in December 2010, and written comments were invited. So reports on the draft Cabinet man uh, Manual, written by Gus O'Donnell, uh, were produced by the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee, the House of Lords Constitutional the Constitution Committee and the Public Administration Select Committee and a summary of the comments received and the government's response to the reports of the Select Committees were published uh, in the update, alongside the updated Cabinet Manual. So there were some updates done. But just to put this in perspective, the Cabinet Manual arbitrarily decided what the Constitution would be. So this, this began the, the real constitutional reform agenda in 2010. And they, they then asked the government to comment on it. In other words, the government began a process of redefining its own relationship, its own rules, its own, it, the, the rules by which it would, it would operate. So when you give um, a parliament which is out of control, that considers that it has the divine right to, to rule, um, when you give it the authority to set its own rules, that's, that's really a pretty incredible thing to do, isn't it? Can I say no, yeah. Mike? I'm agreeing with you, but I'm going to say no, okay. because, of course, Gus O'Donnell, Sir Bob Kerslake, uh, Francis Maud were working with Common Purpose at the time. Julia Middleton and, and uh, Sir David, David Bell were there at the heart of the British Cabinet Office assisting with this. And what does Common Purpose say? It's perfectly fine to act outside your authority. So, so we knew where this was coming from, and, of course, what were the links with Common Purpose through to a Marxist organisation, Demos. So 
This is subversion. Indeed. So I'm just going to say, Independent, you should be ashamed of that article because you missed the points completely. And I just want to reiterate that the only constitutional uh, campaign group which is actually fighting to reassert the current constitution yeah. and not change it beyond all recognition is the British Constitution Group. Uh, please get involved in that campaign if you can, um, because uh, if we throw out what is there, if we throw out 1,500 years of precedent, we're really doing ourselves a massive disservice and we're just allowing these uh, psychopaths and um, child molesters um, to, to run, the country. run the country, rule our lives. Uh, well, it's becoming clearer by the day what's going on. I'd just like to give another thank you out to the uh, caller who provided some information this morning uh, talking about exactly this subject, the Constitution, but also he was talking about the Bradbury Pound. Uh, so we'd like to thank you for that call. Um, we do understand what you're saying to us. Uh, Mike, you're not aware of this at the moment, but somebody who was saying to us, keep going on the key subjects. So constitution, common law, uh, Bradbury pounds, so financial matters, and of course the child abuse. These are the actual things which uh, uh, the government uh, cannot defend its, its actions and will come unstuck. Well, we have constantly said where people stand up and do the right things, uh, we and the public should be behind them. So we just want to remind people about this uh, extraordinary interview that we did um, last week uh, with Welsh Assembly member Bethan Jenkins, uh, finally a mainstream politician um, who has said, no, I'm going to go for what the truth is and what is needed to get justice. So she's been brave enough to speak out about the Linda Lewis child snatching case in South Wales, Neathport, Talbot, South Wales. So if you haven't seen that interview yet, please uh, get on to the uh, uh, UK Column account and have a look. And of course, we followed it by an interview with Kevin Edwards, also talking about progress with the Linda Lewis case. Why is this case so important? Because it is uh, one of the heavyweight cases that can take the uh, can take the uh, lid off the fact the government is stealing uh, our children and many of those children of course are being horribly abused. Uh, well you've got some more good news about the uh, UK column. Uh, right so uh, the website wasn't uh, deployed this weekend um, we didn't make that deadline so it'll happen this coming weekend um, and uh, it is now in the next stage of tests so a bit of final testing going on at the moment um, and uh, we're going to invite um, a few people from the uh, a few of our members to get involved in that testing as as the week progresses, um, but that does mean that the UK column website uh, will be down over this coming weekend yeah. um, while we make these updates. Right. I uh, noticed a question on PayPal there in the chat box. Why is somebody saying why PayPal? Can we give an answer because we we know this is an issue, but we have to deal with them. Well, unfortunately, we sort of do have to deal with PayPal because because there aren't really any other payment processors that um, can accept credit and debit cards, which don't require us uh, to meet um, PCI rules. And these are the rules that are there for uh, for um, handling. handling credit card information and security and so on. Now, the point here is um, that in order to meet the PCI rules, we've got to have a security audit of websites done um, you know, at least quarterly, and this is an expensive thing, and this is not something that we feel that we should be spending um, members' money on. Uh, the money should be spent on the campaign and not on paying um, these uh, consultancies to run security audits for us uh, for the sake of handling credit people's credit card information. So um, aside from that, you know, PayPal is still one of the cheapest um, options out there. Um, and, I mean, if we if we look at, uh, at WorldPay, for example, you've got to pay them three, four, five hundred pounds up front just to decide whether you're actually able to be one of their customers or not. Um, so again, this is not a good use of money. So uh, really every every way we look, unfortunately, PayPal is the, is the least worst option, despite the, 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 the fact that we all know how, how horrible it is as a corporate body. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. And uh, a final um, little ad here. Basically, we're working on all of the Facebook sites at the moment. So there's been an update to my own um, Facebook over the weekend. As I've said on the, on the wall, that uh, the aim is not to talk about myself. It's to provide that Facebook page as a resource. I've had a remarkably good reaction to putting up a nice sunny picture. So that was obviously a good thing to do. 
Um, but if you don't know what I'm saying, have a look on my Facebook page and uh, we'd love to drive up the numbers of friends because these friends are people that we're hoping are going to be doing things. Well, why do we need to get out there and do things? Uh, let's just remind ourselves of uh, this. It was, uh, well, we called them the Dirty Dozen, visiting the West London Synagogue in order to uh, fawn over the life of uh, Leon Britton. And we found this particularly objectionable at a time when um, child abuse survivor Melanie Shaw is having a horrific time in Sodexo's profit-making prison in Peterborough. We know she's been through another punishment routine. We know that she's been in solitary confinement again. Um, these are some of the faces. These men have got questions to answer on a number of subjects. But let's have a look about the mainstream press is playing with things. Uh, Daily Mail from uh, Friday just gone. Nice big advert, 72 million for jackpot event. Uh, but oh dear, look what's hidden away right down at the bottom. A very interesting little article. Uh, what is it about? Well, it's about the fact that Leon Britton refused a call to ban the paedophile support group Pi. He, he said, well, really, it's the crime that's the problem. The fact that we've got people supporting a crime, that's not a problem. So no, I don't want to ban the paedophile group Pi. And of course, this is the same Mr. Britton that went on to lose not just a couple of papers, but uh, dossiers pointing out paedophile activity in UK. Well, Daily Mail, that's some pretty dirty reporting in our opinion, because that should have been front page. But let's have a look behind the scenes because things get better. We've got a Met Police that can't investigate paedophile rings in Westminster but they've got the time and public money to work with the BBC. As we often say on the UK Column News, we just can't make this up. Well, we don't have to. Here it is. We've got a new documentary series with the BBC in bed with the Met Police uh, in order to uh, boast what a good job they're doing. This is sheer propaganda, isn't it? Absolute propaganda and uh, decided we'd take this one apart. Uh, well, here's the lady. She's a freelancer, Abigail Priddle. Uh, very interesting. If you go and have a look at her tweet page, it's all protected. So she's a pretty secretive person. Uh, but you can find some detail on her. And she's, an ex she's got an excellent sense of what makes a good story. And she's got an instinct for casting. So she's got ex significant experience in negotiating and maintaining access with a number of charities institutions and individuals frequently in highly charged emotional situations. So a BBC that, that can't deal with paedophiles operating in its own organisation jumps in bed with the Met Police. Well, let's have a look at this because it's so um, outrageous. Um, what are they really doing? Well, the BBC is clearly in to boost the, bet, the Met's image of being corrupt and incompetent. Uh, here's the head honcho of the Spaghetti Western. It's uh, Bernard Hogan Howe. And there he is. If he had his horse outside New Scotland Yard, the scene would be set. Uh, the first thing they're doing is nudging the public mind away from child abuse. So they're going to focus on uh, Mark, the death of Mark Duggan. And uh, Mike, I know you said uh, before we went live that uh, that would be a good way to help stir up racial tension um, ready for the hot summer. Mm. And uh, bring in this, uh, here's, here's the lovely lady, Abigail Priddle. Um, she's a BBC storyteller, but what she's really doing is reframing the public perception of the Met. Well, it gets better. Uh, here's the Guardian, and the Guardian points out that they're not very happy with what's going on, but it calls it a puff piece, and they take the mickey out the fact that Sir Bernard Hogan Howe uh, carries out an arrest on camera. That's an amazing coincidence, isn't it? Just as the BBC's there, he happens to be out of his office and he arrests somebody. Mm, um, not staged at all. Yeah, not staged. Well, The Guardian says it's a puff piece. We say it's an outrage. It's a waste of public money while they can't get to grips with child abuse and other crimes go uninvestigated. 
But um, why would um, Mr Hogan Howe need the help of the BBC? Well, let's go back in history a bit, and thanks to the Mirror, uh, because it was the Mirror that blasted this, that Met Police Chief Sir Bernard Hogan Howe is facing a probe over a child abuse cover-up. So, pretty obvious what's going on here. If your reputation is uh, at risk, call in the BBC because they're pretty good at covering up child abuse in the first place. Yeah. It is nearly unbelievable if it wasn't in front of our faces. And the BBC then puts the icing on this cake because they've been promoting a play by Jonathan Mait Maitland, uh, which is effectively making light of Jimmy Savile. And uh, here we are with the Andrew Marr show advertising this man's play uh, in which uh, the man himself is saying sometimes drama can answer the really important questions more effectively. More effectively than what? More effectively the truth than a and, judicial process? Yeah, it would appear yeah. so. Mm. Um, we'll just have a docudrama and twist people's minds and then they're really going to be pretty confused about what happened in the BBC. This organisation is disgraceful and uh, somebody said to me a while ago there had been a number of demonstrations outside BBC local offices and it was quite, um, it was quite obvious the BBC got pretty worried about that. It seems to me there's a need for the public to really show the BBC uh, that they've had enough of this 3.65 billion propaganda machine that is protecting child abusers. Uh, well, if you'd like to learn about Mr. Maitland, uh, what you'll discover pretty quickly is that uh, he was a law graduate, is a law graduate from King's College. Uh, he's a writer, broadcaster and an author. Oh dear, who joins the BBC in 19, uh, 1985. So essentially, um, the BBC provides free publicity for one of their own. Mm. Pretty good, isn't it? And uh, just to keep the... Uh, Iron in the fire on the BBC. We couldn't resist this one from the Independent. The BBC comes under investigation by Ofcom for airing child's comments about getting foreigners out. Uh, so let's look at the article. It says Ofcom, which regulates broadcast media, is looking into whether due care and attention was paid by the corporation to the child's welfare. OK, and this is the second one. The BBC is under investigation by the television regulator after it broadcast footage of a young boy saying he was voting UKIP to get all the foreigners out of the country. So the reality of this is that it was spinning the truth. The BBC used the story to blatantly smear UKIP and the investigation by Ofcom is nothing to do with polit political smears. It's twisted to the welfare of the child. Mm. It's... Uh, Unbelievable. Mm. Well, just before we stick with the Independent, um, this morning, actually on the way in in the car, I was listening to Radio 4, as I do, because, of course, how else am I going to find out the news agenda for the yeah. day? Right? Um, and uh, they were promoting uh, Richard Thaler's new book. And Richard Thaler, for those who don't know, um, was uh, uh, the guy behind the Behavioural Insights team, uh, the government's Behavioural Insights team, and we already mentioned that today. Um, and uh, he... Uh, so, so it's not just government behavioural change is the point here that we should be concerned about, though, uh, although the BBC isn't promoting this particular thing because uh, last week The Independent was promoting this. Uh, this is uh, Thine, or sorry, Think, sorry, I do apologise, Think. Uh, company launches mood-changing wearable. What do you think of this, Brian? A newly released headset hopes to wake people up or calm them down by manipulating the electricity in their brain. Think costs two hundred and ninety nine dollars and has just been released to the public. It provides calm or energy on demand. The company says by neuro signaling to activate nerves and change people's state of mind. This is a bit beyond nudging. It has to be said. The whole thing is controlled by your phone. The zapping, as the uh, independent calls it, lasts an hour, but the effects can go on for much longer than that. The company claims. Um. So, this is uh pretty incredible that they are now attempting to directly influence people's mood. So what, next step, you have a secret court, a family court says, mother, you've got some uh, mental health problems. 
uh, we are going to require you to wear one of these devices. Mm. If you do, then you can see your child. This is the sort of thing that's going on. Mm. So this is uh, welcome to the Internet of Things. That's really what this is about. Uh, but it doesn't end, end there because Alert Me has been sold to British Gas. Uh, and uh, what is Alert Me? Well, this is uh, one of the British Gas, of course, one of the biggest corporates wanting to control every aspect of our lives. We've all seen the advertisements for Hive. Uh, and other things that they're promoting at the moment. And they've just bought this company, Alert Me, funded in 2006. Uh, and that has developed a market-leading Internet of Things platform that connects devices in UK and US homes and allows corporate partners to offer remote monitoring and control, data analytics, intelligent automation for single home ecosystems. That's what they say. Um, and of course, it uh, won... Um, support from Innovate, Innovate UK. Now, who is Innovate UK? Well, that, of course, is the new name for the Technology Strategy Board, which uh, Innovate UK is an executive non-departmental public body sponsored by the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Uh, and so they funded uh, Alert Me, which is there to control our homes. Alert Me has just sold their technology to British Gas for £65 million. And there you go. We are now... Um, Going to be controlled by so British Gas. We've got crim criminals and paedophiles sitting in power who are making the decision to get this stuff into our lives. Yes. It, it's dangerous stuff. And, and yes, indeed. Now, last week we mentioned this, our, uh, this uh, report from Big Brother Watch Police Access to Communications Data, and they were showing pretty, pretty stark statistics. Um, this week we have the next thing from Priv Privacy in International. Um, this is uh, uh, a new briefing uh, two years after Snowden, it's called Two Years After Snowden, Protecting Human Rights in an Age of Mass Surveillance. And it's warning that governments are looking to maintain and expand mass surveillance and really highlighting the point that uh, the NSA has had its wings clipped slightly by uh, what happened in the Senate last week. But the G GCHQ is still entitled to go right ahead and demand, uh, you know, blanket huge quantities of data from uh, from various uh, public uh, uh, suppliers of telecoms uh, services and so on. Um, but also um, this organization and Amnesty International are taking a case to the Inter Investigatory Powers Tribunal uh, and that is the uh, body that uh, the judicial body that hears complaints about intelligence services uh, and surveillance by public organizations. Um, and so they're attempting to bring a legal claim uh, to the IPT uh, to uh, call for an end to the harvesting of information. Uh, about those who have no ties to terrorism uh, and are not suspected of any crime. Now, of course, uh, what is what is the situation with regard to that? Because who is suspected of crimes? Um, as we know, uh, the G7 is just beginning in uh, in Germany, uh, and here they are, uh, no doubt discussing the T-tip of the uh, rainbow-coloured iceberg that seems to be the uh, the the logo this year. Uh, pretty incredible logo. Pyramid. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, and that's in uh, Schloss Elmar. Pity they wouldn't just lock the doors and set it in fire. I mean, sorry. Oh, yeah. Brief. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, well, here they are, uh, the, the bunch of cowboys that are doing this. Uh, we've got Barack Obama, of course, we've got Cameron, we've got Abe, and we've got Hollande, and we've got Stephen Harper from Canada, and we've got uh, Matteo Renzi uh, from Italy. And uh, aside from working out how to blow up Russia, uh, these guys are going to be talking about climate change and extremism. Um, so um, perhaps that's us, I don't know. Uh, the first working session today is going to focus on climate and energy, and Merkel is going to try and get uh, the other leaders to agree uh, to keeping temperature rises within 2 degrees C of, of pre-industrial levels. Uh, and uh, so there you go. So, so these people can't control poverty, they can't run a national health system, they can't fill in the potholes in the road, but they can control the world's climate. Yes. Are they, the, 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 these are psychotic people. The, are they the, low empathy, psychotic people? Well, that's absolutely right. And of course, uh, um, is Cameron demonstrating a bit of uh, psychotic behaviour here with this, uh, this comment, this warning, uh, his, uh, his uh, fellow colleagues that if they back him, if they don't back him over the, his renegotiation of the uh, European uh, relationship, uh, they're going to have to resign. Uh, yeah, <laughs> amazing. So uh, 
this is this of course this whole thing is about Cameron he's been touring the continent trying to get uh, people to agree to put limitations on migration so that he can uh, fix or fix I suppose is the right word uh, the upcoming uh, referendum but the independent here is suggesting that he risks opening old wounds by demanding that he gets back uh, that he gets backing from government uh, for his coming plan but of course uh, the suggestion that uh, old wounds being opened uh, would be an unintended consequence would be I think to misrepresent the situation uh, I think he knows uh, that the only way he's going to get his agenda through is to keep people distracted and that's really what this is all about he's intending to start this argument within the uh, Tory party so people believe there's actually some reality to the debate but in fact there's no reality because it's all coming in by the back door uh, absolutely and also also to make sure that the media agenda is absolutely filled with this kind of nonsense um, while all this other stuff has um, slipped in under the radar. Yeah. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of the news today. I'm just going to say, because a couple of people are mentioning it in our chat room, yes, we fully understand that it was never UKIP policy to call for all immigrants in Britain to be removed. That was really the point of our report, that what was the uh, BBC doing there, deliberately smearing UKIP, and of course, it isn't UKIP, is it? It's the uh, over 4 million people that voted for UKIP are being attacked by the BBC. So if you're a UKIP member, wouldn't it be wonderful if all those UKIP members, 4 million of them, decided that they didn't really want to pay the BBC? Yeah. Could be just a thought there. And um, I'll also just say once again, thank you very much to all of you who've taken up subscriptions with us or made donations. We do need your help to run uh, UK Column News. And uh, if you can encourage other people to subscribe or make a small do donation to us, that would be greatly appreciated. It's only with your help we can do uh, what we do. I think that's about it, Mike. Yep. OK, thanks very much for joining us. We're going to open the studio door and let in some sunshine. Uh, have a good afternoon and we'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.